Hi, and uh, welcome to this last video on support vector machines. So uh, through the last sequence of many videos, we've been working our way towards this formulation of uh, support vector machines that try to look for uh, maximum margin separating hyperplanes. In particular, in the last video, we also looked at a regularized version that can handle uh, points that are uh, just a few outliers that will not have a large margin uh, on the data set. <clears throat> so what we ended up with with this uh, dual formulation of finding such a hyperplane sets we have to maximize over uh, the choice of uh, alpha vector of uh, parameters, uh, maximizing this objective value here subject to a bunch of constraints. One of them is that the sum of alpha i yi is zero, and the other one being that these alpha i coefficients lies between zero and c. So you have to go back and watch the last couple of videos to, if you uh, haven't seen the derivation of this uh, optimization problem. So what we need to do now is we would like to solve this from, uh, this optimization problem. In particular, we would like to do it uh, just using kernels, just thinking of a kernel uh, being applied here in terms of this inner product. So uh, with this kernel formulation, right, this is an optimization problem. We have to choose these alphas. And um, the way we're going to do it is using a technique called coordinate ascent. So let me first give you the basic idea in coordinate ascent and then show you why it doesn't work and then how we can fix it uh, to work uh, for this setup. So the basic idea in coordinate ascent is in some sense similar to gradient descent. So you start somewhere in a feasible solution, which means one that satisfies the constraint up there. And one way to satisfy all these constraints, an easy way is to set all the alpha i's to zero, right? Then we clearly satisfied all these uh, alpha i being between zero and c. And we also satisfy that the sum of this alpha i, y i is zero. So we start that there. And then the basic idea in coordinate ascent, the classic coordinate ascent is that you keep changing one coordinate of alpha at a time, uh, trying to optimize the objective function, maximizing this objective. So if we try to take this approach, uh, let's see what we would do, right? Then we would choose one of these uh, alpha r. Let's say r is the one that we would like to change. And, and then the idea is that we would like to change it to maximize the objective value by only changing this alpha. And at the same time, we would like to ensure that none of the constraints become violated, right? They're right now they're satisfied, at least initially. And then we'd like to just keep changing one coordinate at a time, each time maximizing the objective and keeping all constraints satisfied. So good. So what could we do if we wanted to do this here, right? So we've already decided on a coordinate alpha r we want to, uh, to change. Everything else is fixed. And, and what issues do we encounter here if we try to, to maximize the objective by changing alpha r? Now, if you look a little bit close so to it, we have this special constraint that says that the sum of alpha i, y i uh, must be zero at any given time. Now, this equality here, if you move everything but alpha i to the other side, or alpha r, sorry, you'll get that alpha r actually has to equal uh, the inverse of its label times the sum over all the other i's of alpha i, y i. But all the right-hand side, it doesn't involve alpha r, right? So it basically means that alpha r, we cannot change it. It has to remain fixed. So, so this really says that if I want to maintain a feasible solution, I cannot change alpha r, right? So this coordinate ascent, at least in this basic version, will not work here. We cannot uh, fix all coordinates but one and then change this one coordinate to maximize the objective. So the basic idea that we'll try to pursue is that we'll try to do coordinate ascent on two coordinates at a time. The basic idea is to pick two coordinates, alpha r and alpha s, and uh, fix everything else. So treat them as constant. We cannot change them. And now we're going to change alpha r and alpha s together uh, to maximize this objective when everything else remains fixed. And while we're changing them, we want to ensure that all these constraints down here remain satisfied. Now, if we want to pursue this approach, uh, we can start by looking at the first constraint down here. Right, so this says, again, we can move everything but the terms involving uh, alpha r and alpha s to the other side. So then we would have that alpha r y i, y r, sorry, plus alpha s y s would have to equal the minus of the sum of the rest. And just for simplicity, let's uh, use the special letter uh, psi here to represent the rest of the sum. So what we have to do now is that if we look at this and we want to, uh, and we, let's say, what, what would, would we need to set alpha s to be? Well, so we can move alpha and y r to the other side, and then we can divide by uh, y s. So we get a fixed formula for alpha s, right? So for any given value of alpha r, we have to pick a concrete value of alpha s to satisfy uh, this constraint. <clears throat> 
Okay. So, so basically what we can do is we say, okay, the only variable we're really free to choose is alpha r. Because when we change alpha r, we already know what alpha s has to be. Alpha s has to be this formula down here. So the basic idea now is to say, well, we're going to choose alpha r to maximize this objective, where in, whenever we have an alpha s in here in this uh, expression, we have it both in the first sum and inside the double sums. Whenever we have an alpha s, we replace it by this, uh, this value here. OK, so then all the occurrences of alpha s will be replaced by something that involves alpha r and all the other variables. Right, so, so now we only have one variable that we're free to choose. Okay, so right. So we want to make sure that while we're changing this alpha r, uh, we need to satisfy the constraints to keep them uh, satisfied. And we already know, right, by just forcing alpha s to take this form, we know that we are going to satisfy this the sum of the alpha i y i is equal to zero. So the ones that we could be worried about is these constraints on the alpha i's. Now, of course, the only thing that is going to change when we change alpha i is alpha i itself and also alpha s. And these are the only two that change. The rest remain fixed. So we're still, so if we satisfied the constraints and all the other alphas before we started uh, changing alpha and alpha s, we're going to keep those satisfied. So the only ones we have to pay attention to is the constraint on alpha and alpha s. Good. So, so these are the only ones that change. And the only thing we have to satisfy is that while we change them, they have to uh, remain between zero and c. Those are the only two, two constraints that we have. Okay, so let's try and see. So we know that alpha s has to lie between zero and c, and we know this is a formula for alpha s. Now, this expression here, we want to write it into a formula on alpha r instead, a constraint on alpha r, right? Because now we don't have an alpha s anymore, we have an alpha r here, and we want to turn this into a constraint on alpha r. So what we can do is that we can, or we want to get rid of this ys inverse, so we multiply with ys, on to c and on to zero. We to subtract uh, this huge sum here off uh, on both sides, and on all, all the, the sides here. And finally, we can multiply uh, with the inverse of yr with a minus in front. Right, So that uh, gets rid of everything except the alpha r here in the middle. And now one has to be a little bit careful here when we are doing these multiplications because when we're multiplying with ys inverse and yr inverse, or the ys here, these could be negative. And whenever you multiply with a negative number, uh, you flip the direction of inequalities. So that's just something to be aware of here, right? So the yis, actually the inverse here doesn't really matter, right? Because the inverse of one is it's one itself and the inverse of minus one is also minus one. So, so you could have, the inverse really doesn't matter here. Okay, so we just have to be pay attention um, Okay, down here, I guess we multiply with a minus yr. So there's also, there's another flip here with this minus. All right, so, okay. So this means if you uh, examine the two carefully, what we get on the two sides, whether the inequalities flip once or twice, uh, we can get either if they're equal, then uh, the inequalities flip. In this case, uh, I guess here you're going to, flip it once for the minus one, and then uh, either twice or zero times if they're equal here. So you're going to flip it an odd number of times, which means that the constraint on the upper bound on the C moves moves down. And all we did here was this uh, multiply with the inverse of Ys, which is the same as Ys. We multiply with minus Yr, and we also subtracted off this, this double sum. So basically, one just has to pay attention to the signs here in the labels. And depending on which way they, uh, they flip, uh, the constraint just turns into one of those two constraints on alpha r. I said everything we're doing is just taking this constraint and rewriting it as a constraint on alpha r, just by standard moving things around and just paying attention to uh, multiplying with negative numbers and how many times we're doing it. And even on odd number of times, that, that tells us how many times the direction of inequalities flip. Okay. So right, what we also have to do is, so this is a constraint on alpha r that we get actually from saying that alpha s has to lie between zero and c. We also know that the original alpha r also has to lie between zero and C. So, so we can add that in. So we said, okay, it has to be greater than or equal to the maximum of the two and less than or equal to the minimum of C in this term we had before and the, and the same down here, right? So we get one of those two constraints where we have a, a max and a min here, right? So, so this just gives us a range where we have to choose alpha i inside to maximize now this whole expression here. 
Okay. Now the question is now now that we know what is the range that we need to choose alpha r in, uh, how can we choose it? Right. So so how would we choose it to maximize this objective? And the way we can do it is uh, where we have this whole objective that we need to maximize. And the occurrence of alpha s, we're just going to replace it by this term involving alpha r. And we're going to do that whenever we see an alpha s in here, we're going to replace it by this term that includes alpha r instead. Right. So, so that just means that now we have this optimization problem. And the, I guess the only variable that we're free to, to change is alpha r in this huge expression here. Now, so how can we maximize this? Uh, when, but when we notice here is that, well, if you fix everything but alpha r, everything else is constant. This is just a quadratic function of alpha r, right? Over here, it can, it can occur only with a coefficient, uh, like a linear term, one from the alpha s and one from the alpha r term. In here, right, we have the double sum. So we can get products of two things that involve alpha r. So we can actually get a, we get a quadratic function of alpha r that we need to maximize. So all that we we really need to maximize is actually a simple thing. We just we can just compute this a, b, and a c, so that the thing we have to maximize is a times alpha r squared plus b times alpha r plus c. For some a, b, and c, we can compute. And also we have these constraints on alpha r, right? They have to lie between the, these minimum and a maximum, right? And so, uh, so so that's basically what we have to do. We have to maximize this quadratic function in a range. This is really simple, right? So the, we have some range of alpha hour where we can, uh, where we are allowed to put it. And the range is either one of the two up here at the top. It's not so important what it is, right? We can compute this lower bound on alpha and the upper bound on alpha. R. This gives us a range where we need to maximize a quadratic function uh, of alpha. R. And so to maximize such a quadratic function, I guess the thing is if the linear term or the, the quadratic term is zero, then I guess the function is just a line, right? Either it's an increasing line or a decreasing line. And so we see that the maximum uh, must be at one of the endpoints, right? So either over here or over here, right? So the maximum has to lie in one of those two uh, places. And well, if the leading term is, is not zero, I guess it's a quadratic function. So uh, it can be any one of these, these shapes here. And I guess the observation is that either if, well, if the peak is outside the interval, then uh, the maximum is gonna lie at one of the endpoints, which is like the case here. It could also be if, if the function uh, points downwards, the maximum can also be in one of the endpoints. And it could also be uh, here in the middle where the gradient is zero. And so actually, these are the only cases, right? It's either at one of the two endpoints or where the gradient is zero. Now, the gradient, we can easily compute, right? This is a, just a degree two uh, polynomial. So the gradient is just uh, two A times alpha R plus B. And where the gradient is zero, you just get a formula here alpha r is minus b over 2a. So what you can do is you can check, well, if this lies inside the allowed region between these two endpoints, then uh, we can just evaluate the whole expression, uh, the whole uh, degree two polynomial at this point and get a value for it. If it lies outside, then we should not evaluate this point, but only the endpoints. So basically what we do is we just evaluate uh, this degree two polynomial at the two endpoints and if the place where the gradient is zero lies in between the two endpoints, we also evaluate it there. And the maximum of those three is the one we should choose. It's actually a simple optimization problem. And this gives the so-called SMO algorithm. Uh, the basic idea in the SMO algorithm for solving this uh, uh, SVM dual problem is to start at a feasible solution alpha, for instance, the all zeros, and then you repeat until you're satisfied. Uh, so you pick two coordinates, alpha R and alpha S, fix all others, and maximize the objective while ensuring that all the constraints remain satisfied. And to maximize this alpha r and alpha s, we just showed it suffices to solve a quadratic equation in just alpha r. Right. So the question is, of course, when do you stop? When are you satisfied? And well, so one can show that based on these KKT conditions, uh, we're not going to go into too much detail with this. Uh, it's you are actually at an optimal solution if all these things are satisfied. If alpha i is equal to zero implies that, well, the label y i times, I guess the, the prediction that you would make before taking science with this hyperplane, or also said the functional margin, if the functional margin is at least one, if alpha i is c, then the functional margin should be less than equal to one. And whenever the uh, alpha i lies between zero and c, then the functional margin should be exactly one. So you can use the KKT conditions uh, that we saw earlier to show that, well, if you reach a point where all these are satisfied, then you're actually at an optimal solution. So you can, you can stop them, right? 
Uh, in practice, what you're going to do is you're going to allow a little bit of slack here, and you're going to include a tolerance, which is like a hyperparameter you as a user of the algorithm can specify. So you set a tolerance to be maybe 0 0.01 or 0 0.001, and then you start when these things are approximately satisfied. And also just to avoid numerical rounding issues in these optimization steps. So you basically say, well, if, if I stop when all these three things are satisfied, that for all the coefficient well is zero, the functional margin is at least one minus epsilon. For all the L fry, uh, the ones where L fry is C, the functional margin is no more than one plus epsilon. And finally, for all the ones in between, the functional margin lies between one minus epsilon and one plus epsilon. So these are the, uh, the, the termination criteria that you will actually be using if you were to implement it. Right. So, so that's the SMO algorithm. Just start at a feasible alpha and then repeat until uh, satisfied, until all these conditions or constraints are satisfied at the same time. So pick two coordinates and fix all others, and then you maximize the objective while ensuring that all the constraints remain satisfied. And you can do this by solving this quadratic equation alpha. And now you just stop when all these uh, tolerance criteria are, uh, are satisfied. Okay. And actually you can still argue that uh, this alpha is are going to be, or you can see just based on these, these tolerances or these conditions up here that the alpha is at the end of the day can only um, be non-zeros for vectors whose, whose functional margin uh, is no more than, uh, than one plus epsilon, right? Because as you see on these two last conditions here, right? Uh, alpha i is zero means that the functional margin is less than equal to one plus epsilon. And here, the, the ones here that are non-zero is also well, between one minus epsilon and one plus epsilon. So it's definitely less than equal to uh, one plus epsilon, which basically means if you think about it, if you had the, the margin here, it means that only the, the training examples that are close to the margin, not exactly on the margin, but, but kind of close or in between, uh, a little bit outside the margins and, and into uh, the center here. This is kind of the intuition to have in mind. Only the, uh, the, the training examples that are kind of close to uh, the separating or the hyperplane that you end up using uh, will be used with non-zero coefficients uh, at the end of the day. And remember, again, if you remember from the previous videos, once we've solved or found all these alpha i's, uh, we know what w should be. We had this fixed formula for w. And I also mentioned in the previous video that it's also possible to find the b, and it's not a too hard algorithmic game. Right. So, so that's the SMO algorithm. Uh, you just keep solving these quadratic equations, doing coordinate ascent. You fix two coordinates, alpha r and alpha s, and then you're trying to change those to maximize the objective while retaining uh, a feasible solution. And you just keep ongoing until uh, you basically satisfy uh, these conditions you can derive from the KKT conditions. So, so that's all there is on the support vector machines. So let us end it here.